All right, so blood pressure, by definition, is the pressure exerted uh, on the arteries during the cardiac cycle. All right, and so what are the two, two components of the cardiac cycle? We have the blank and the blank. All right, so we have systolic blood pressure, and we have diastolic blood pressure, all right? Or if we're talking, again, the cardiac cycle, we have systole and diastole, all right? And so systole is ventricular contraction when blood is being ejected, all right? So the ventricles contract, blood is ejected to the rest of the body. Diastole is ventricular filling, all right? And so blood pressure is really dependent on two different things, right? And so two factors kind of dictate someone's blood pressure and how blood pressure will change, say, uh, as we exercise or as we be become dehydrated or as there are changes in uh, elasticity of the blood vessels with age. Right? But blood press pressure is dependent on cardiac output, all right, and total peripheral resistance. All right, so any change in these factors will affect blood pressure. So example, what happens to cardiac output during exercise? So remember cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. All right, what happens to cardiac output during exercise? Goes up, all right, the heart's beating more frequently, stroke volume increases, so cardiac output will increase, and that will have caused systolic pressure to go up during exercise, all right? Um, total peripheral resistance is dependent primarily, the number one factor that determines total peripheral resistance is the diameter of the blood vessels, all right? And so uh, what happens to blood vessel diameter during exercise? All right. To working muscles, blood vessels vasodilate, so they open up, and vasodilation will, in, uh, will, will cause a decrease in blood pressure. So as those blood vessels expand, the total peripheral resistance actually comes down, and that has uh, an effect of decreasing blood pressure. All right. um, now, some blood vessels will constrict, all right. um, but typically during exercise, there's a, a substantially greater vasodilation when compared to vasoconstriction, all right? Um, different types of exercise can affect total peripheral resistance. So those that are, were, have taken exercise physiology, there are differences in how blood pressure responds to cycling versus doing a wall squat. So you squat down and you hold that position for two minutes, right? There are differences in how blood pressure responds because when we're cycling, what we call rhythmic dynamic exercise, what do the muscles do? They contract and relax, contract and relax, all right? With a wall sit, everybody's done these before, I squat down, what do the muscles do? Start, well, I start to twitch. Right? They'll start to shake after you get tired, but do they, are they relaxing at all? Are these quadriceps here, are they relaxing or are they just contracted? They're just contracted, and so that contraction causes substantially uh, higher peripheral resistances. And so it actually, they actually, uh, like isometric exercise, when we bear down, you push against the wall or whatever, any think of an isometric exercise. That causes significantly higher total peripheral resistances, and so it actually causes systolic blood pressure to increase and diastolic blood pressure to increase. Now, typically, so with, that's isometric. So this is, we'll just say this increase in systole is exercise in general, right? But this increase in diastole is with isometric, all right? With rhythmic dynamic exercise, what actually happens? There's really no change or a slight decrease with um, rhythmic exercise. So how the body responds is different, right? How blood pressure responds, I should say, to different types of exercise will change. Right? All that to be said, right, what we're measuring is pressure in the arteries during ventricular contraction 
and ventricular filling. Right? That's, that's what we're, we're looking at when we measure blood pressure. And so this process of taking blood pressure uh, is pretty straightforward. You guys have all done it before, but when we come in and you do an assessment um, or when you, do, when you do your practical, I'm gonna look for you to do it this specific way. All right, so you go to the nurse, you go to the doctor, they put the cuff on, they just inflate it, all right, really fast, let it out really fast. Well, they're, they're experienced at it, all right? But there's proper inflation and deflation rates um, and how long this should take, okay? So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. All right. I need a volunteer. All right, come on up. Let's see. You. Are you okay to be on camera? You're going to be videoed. Are you okay with that? You don't have to be. Get camera. Camera shy. I have a camera based on random friends. Okay. So first thing, when we're, we're going to talk about resting blood pressure measurement, all right? So resting blood pressure measurement, when they come in to do their assessment, when you bring a client in, ideally they come in and they're going to do all their paperwork, they're going to do all the signatures, fill out their health history, and those types of things. That'll take about five to ten minutes, all right? After they do all that is when we'll start taking blood pressure, all right? So there's, a, there's an order. So we do informed consent, we do health history, uh, lifestyle evaluation, et cetera. And then we go straight into resting blood pressure, right? resting heart rate. And then we can get them up and do height, weight, body composition, and start all the other things. Right? So we come in, they're rested. She, she sat for five or so minutes, 10 minutes, filled out her paperwork. Right? And then, of course, there has to be some physical contact. And so we need to ask permission. Is it okay if I touch, touch your arm to take blood pressure? Yeah. All right. Title nine, we want to get permission. All right. No unwarranted touching, even if it is just blood pressure. All right. So uh, we want to ask permission that we can, we can do that. All right. So you're good with me taking your blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. Environment is important as well. Typically, we want it to be a relaxed environment. All right. Quiet. Thermo neutral, cool, 70, 72 degrees, low humidity. All right. Um, now, obviously, if you're in the fitness center, you can go in the lab setting, in the in the classroom, and do blood pressures and resting measurements. That's perfectly fine. Um, it'll make it a lot easier for you to hear as well, because we have to be able to hear the sounds of uh, of karat cough. All right. And I'll explain what those are. All right. So environment. All right. And then positioning. When we're doing resting blood pressure, we want to make sure that they're seated with their feet flat on the floor, right? Legs can't be crossed. And that might be something that people inadvertently do is they come in and they sit and they got their legs crossed like this. And you don't, if you don't say anything to them, then I'm going to take a point off. Because that crossing of legs can restrict some blood flow and it can affect blood pressure. So you want to make sure they're seated with their feet flat on the floor, all right? Now, Arm height is important as well. When you measure their blood pressure, you want to make sure that their arm height is even with the level of their heart. So there's no arm rest on here. So one thing I could do is I could have her slide over, rest her arm on the table, right? but then she gets out of camera view, so we're not going to do I that like right that. now. Let's do that. All right. But I'm going to, so I'm going to hold her arm when I take blood pressure, and I'll show you the best way because you can hold her arm and still have both hands free. All right. And so the way that we'll do that is I'll grab her arm and I'm gonna basically brace it between my elbow and my side so that way my hands are still free and her arm is stabilized so that um, she's not contracting or holding it up herself. Because if she's holding it up herself, those muscles are contracting and again, that can affect blood pressure. So environment and then positioning. All right, so seated, relaxed, feet flat on the floor, all right, arm at heart height rested okay now our equipment we have our blood pressure cuff and sphygmo manometer all right so this right here and this is actually needs to probably be adjusted a little bit it's actually a little bit off so this isn't going to be completely accurate i'm going to have to at a certain time i'm going to have to adjust this it's a little bit off but you've got your sphygmo manometer all right and then we have our cuff now if you notice you see this it says range there are different size cuffs, right? So these little white lines here, what we wanna make sure of is that when we put this on their arm, 
that this portion right here, the end of the cuff, and when we snugly put it on their arm, that it falls in between those that proper range. Right? If their arm is too small, it could be like that. That's going to affect blood pressure. If their arm is too big, all right, it can be out here. And again, that can take blood pressure. All right? So I know some of you have to, have, should be using a children's cuff. <laughs> all right. Some of you have to be using a children. I didn't say any names. All right. Um, some of you should be using a children's cuff. All right, and that's okay. Narrow. Some should be. All right, you guys remember Jewel? All right, Jewel needed an extra large cuff. All right. So uh, you know, we don't have any different sizes though. All right. So this is just a normal adult cuff. All right. So that's what this range is. Now we also have a marker here. It says left arm or right arm, and where that arrow is, that is we want to try and line that up as best as possible with the brachial artery, right? So we'll have to find the brachial artery uh, in the elbow here, all right, on each individual. And you want to line that up as close as possible. Left and right, you're looking at them? So their actual arm. So if I'm looking at her like this, that's, I'm look, it's my left, but it's her right arm, all right? So we want to um, line it up appropriately according to them, all right? And then we have our stethoscope. All right, and so this is how obviously we're going to hear. Stay. All right, this is how we're going to hear uh, the sounds. All right, oscillation or listening is what this is. And so if you notice, these are kind of angled. You want the angle going forward in the ear. All right, it's going to fit into the ear canal better. So when you put these in, that angle right there, see how it's kind of pointing up like that? That needs to go forward into the ear canal. All right. And then we have the bell of the stethoscope. Now this one actually can twist. All right. So we have a small side here that you can listen with. Or you have a larger side that you can listen with. So if somebody has a really small arm, you could, you could theoretically use this one. All right. But typically we're just going to use this one. So you want to make sure if you if you whenever you grab one of these just kind of twist it around and see and as it clicks you'll see a hole either appear so right now there's a little hole inside that i can i can see as i twist it that hole disappears whichever way that small hole is facing is the side that you're listening with so if you have it twisted the wrong way and you put that on somebody's arm you're not going to hear anything and, and when you say well I can't hear anything. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come and twist this and check and make sure you're listening with the right the right uh, side. All right. So you want to make sure that the that it's facing the correct way. You yes. Don't do off that too, right? No. No. I, I won't take points off for that. All right. All right. So there's our there's our equipment. Everybody good so far? Okay. So the first step in taking blood pressure, the first thing we're going to do, we've got them in the right environment, we've got them positioned, all right? So I'm going to place the cuff on the arm, all right? We also need a child's cuff, all right? Um, we want to make sure that you got your little inflatable here. If you twist it to the right, righty tighty, that means this valve is closed, you can inflate. Lefty Lucy is when air starts to come out, all right? So we don't want to, and we don't need to like twist it down. It's just basically twist it until it stops, all right? It doesn't need to be a tighten, 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 all right? And then to let it out, that way you don't have to get pliers to un unloosen it. But righty tighty, lefty Lucy. Everybody good with that? And I, you, I can't tell you how many times, Mr. Pearson, I can't get it, I can't get it unloosed. And they're twisting it as hard as they can to the right. And I'm like, well, that's because you're tightening it. All right? That's why it's not getting looser. You're tightening, tightening it. So, all right, righty tighty, lefty loosey. All right. Positioning of the sphygmomanometer, the cuff on the elbow, you want it about one inch, the bottom of the cuff, about one inch above what's called the antecubital fossa, the elbow. All right. So you want the bottom of the cuff about one inch above. And the reason is, whenever you put the bell of the stethoscope on there, it's not going to have to be slid under the cuff and get outside noise. So one inch above the elbow, and then 
the stethoscope bell, the, the bell of the stethoscope can lay flat on the elbow. All right. All right. So the first thing we do here when we actually take, and here's how I position. So again, I've got both hands free. All right. So her arm is, you can just relax your arm completely. It's not falling down. All right. Position this to, of course, to where I can see the dial. All right. Righty tighty. All right. So I'm good. Now, one of the first things we're doing, what we do when we actually measure blood pressure is when we inflate this, we are cutting off blood supply to everything below. All right. So if I inflate it really high and then I just let it sit there, what's going to start happening to her arm? No. It's going to go numb, start tingling because she's not getting blood supply. All right. So what we have to do is we have to create enough pressure in this cuff that cuts off blood supply to the lower arm. Now, how do I know? Uh, typically, you, know, you go in and they say, all right, just inflate it to 200, all right? For most people, some people might have really high blood pressure and that's not enough, but typically if you inflate it to 200, that's gonna cut off blood supply. But what if her systolic pressure is only 100, all right? Why do I need to inflate it all the way to 200, all right? So the first thing, and I want you guys to practice this, is we are going to find the radial pulse. Yours is very faint. Did you find it? I got it. Okay. All right, so remember radius, ulna. Here's how I always remember it. Ulna inside, All right? Radius, radial pulse, it's thumb side. All right, so you are going to find the radial pulse. Just trying to relax, I got you braced. Okay. All right. Once you've found that radial pulse, you are going to slowly inflate the cuff. All right, and as I inflate the cuff, what I'm feeling for is that pulse to disappear. All right. And so once that pulse disappears, what does that mean? That means that the pressure in this cuff is greater than the pressure that her heart is generating. So it's cut off blood supply to that lower arm. All right. So her, I felt her radial pulse go away around, and this doesn't have to be exact. It was around 90 to 100 is where I felt her radial pulse go away. And so when I actually measure her blood pressure, I'm just going to inflate it to about 30 millimeters above that. So if I felt it go, if you feel it go away at 100, then inflate the cuff when you're actually measuring blood pressure to about 130. All right. If you feel it go away at 120, then inflate the cuff to 150. All right. So add about 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury to when you felt it go away. Does that make sense? All right, so with that part, you're not listening, all right? You're not trying to figure out what her actual blood pressure is, all right? You can start to get an idea, but um, it's not going to tell you. It's just going to tell you how, how much we need to inflate the cuff to. Everybody good so far? Okay. So before I actually take her blood pressure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through what to do next, all right? So we've got, we've, we've figured out, all right, it went away around 90 to 100. I'm going to inflate the cuff to just 130. That's what I'm going to do. So once I inflate that cuff to 130, I'm going to twist the valve to the left and slowly let the air out. All right, you'll start to see the pressure of the needle come down. You need to be listening, all right? Because as that pressure comes down, you want to release it at about two to three millimeters of mercury per second. So it's a, just as an example, all right, I inflate it, I pump it up, it's not, like that right there. You hear that? That was way too much. The needle moved way too fast. So two to three millimeters of mercury per second. So the needle's consistently coming down, right? But it's not fast and it's not just, you haven't let any air out and it's barely ticking along, right? So two to three millimeters of mercury per second. And then we're gonna be listening. As that air comes out, pressure in this cuff is decreasing and what's going to start to happen is blood's going to start to come back through. All right. You'll notice the needle start to, to jump. Every time there's a pulse, the needle will start to jump. That is not the systolic blood pressure.
because that pressure can can be getting to this point right here and not coming all the way through right the blood can be getting to this point and not coming all the way through the cuff right? what will happen though is that needle will start to jump and then once the pressure of the heart exceeds the pressure of this cuff you're going to start to hear the pulse right so as i have my stethoscope in i'm going to hear the pulse right the first sound that you hear is called the first sound of Karatkov, and it is the systolic pressure. So the first pulse that you hear is the systolic pressure. Right, good so far? All right. That it'll be pretty faint, but as, as more blood comes back through, as that pressure in the cuff comes down, more blood's gonna come through, you're gonna it's gonna get a little bit louder. All right. But then as the pressure continues to come down, it's going to start to get faint again. You'll hear what's called the fourth sound of Karatkov was essentially a muffling. It sounds like turbulent flow. All right. And then the fifth sound is that sound will disappear. Whenever that sound disappears, that is the diastolic pressure. All right. So at rest, we typically go first, we've always first sound systolic, fifth sound at rest, diastolic. During exercise, we may not ever hear a complete disappearance. And so we go with that fourth sound when we started to hear it muffled. Not a clear pulse, but it's a more muffled sound. Okay? All right. So just hold that for me for one second. Get this in. So angle forward, you can tap it and test. That's the right side. Positioning, I've got both hands free. Now, because the hole is not facing this way, I can use my thumb to put pressure down, all right? And what we wanna do is we wanna place the stethoscope over the brachial artery. And so you can quickly find that. Some people it's pretty difficult to find. Hers is actually pretty easy, but it's usually kind of medial part of the, the elbow right here. All right, so two fingers, all right? Index, middle finger, find the brachial pulse, all right? And that goes flat onto there. You can put pressure. You want this as flat as possible. Arm straight, but not locked out. All right. So I got everything in, valve is closed. Inflate to 130, and then slowly let the air out. So I got 94 over 40. Now, this is, that's probably not, and, and here's, that sounds really low, but if you look at the cuff here, it's not calibrated correctly. All right, so it would actually be a little bit higher. All right, and so that's where, if you came up and looked at this, the needle is not vertical, it's not straight up and down, it's, it's angled the other way. And so that's lower than what it actually is. All right, all right, so you can relax, hold up. Once you're done, completely open the valve, let all of the air out, all right? Don't leave air in there because that keeps pressure on it, and that'll, if you leave it sitting on there, then that's going to uh, cause your arm, could possibly cause your arm to, to get uncomfortable, fall asleep again. Yes? So, whenever we do this, we, like, before we even put on the stethoscope, we just do it to see when the radial pulse goes away. Yes. Then we let it go, then we put on the stethoscope, yep. and we do it again. Yep. Yep, so the, the, first, the first time you pump it up and let the air out, you're just finding where that radial pulse disappears. Second time, you're actually listening all right, and, and determining what their blood pressure is. All right. Now, real life setting, have you ever been to the doctor where they pump it up, they find where your radial pulse disappears? No, they don't, they don't usually do that. But for our purposes, we're going to work on that. We're going to do it. All right. And um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. Okay. You guys have any questions on that? Yeah. So, yep. so when you go to like a doctor or whatever, do they normally just like look at the paperwork and ask 
They should take it. I mean, it's a vital sign. So if you're going to the doctor for an illness or something, they should definitely take it. I mean, either way, you go to the doctor, they should take, be taking your blood pressure, whether it's manual or whether it is with a machine. Manual is more accurate. Yeah, because I was trying to figure out if they just like go from like previous like blood pressure. And like, they oh, shouldn't. Stop from here. No, okay. no, they shouldn't. All right, any other questions? How much does the Bitcoin side affect the reading? Uh, they shouldn't affect too much. Um, there might be some differences. And so uh, one of the assignments you guys are going to have to do is you'll have six people. You'll take blood pressure on their right and their left, and then you'll average them. All right? there, so there could be some differences. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that there's any specific pattern of difference. So like the left arm is always higher than the right arm or the right arm is always – uh, but there could be some differences. And then, of course, with you guys not being experienced measuring, right, there's probably going to be some differences there. Um, if you do multiple measurements on the same person, let them at least rest for a minute or two in between measurements. All right, so completely deflate the cuff. All right, let them rest for a minute or two before taking it again. Okay? But what? As far as like, the cuff being Can you still get an accurate one with If the cuff is the wrong size, there will be some um, error involved with that. So just know that if, if somebody has too small of an arm or too large of an arm, or I shouldn't say that, if the cuff is too small or if the cuff is too large. All right. If they have too small of an arm, then they need to lift more weights. <laughs> right? Right. Okay. All right. Any questions with blood pressure? Okay, so this, again, this is just practice, right? So cuff is deflated, let's take it off. Okay, the other thing that we'll do real quick is just talk about resting heart rate measurement, right? Where do we typically take resting heart rates? What are pulses that we can use? Your wrist and right? neck. So you got your radial, which we just talked about. You got your carotid. Those are the two most common, all right? So radial pulse, again, thumb side. Anytime we're doing pulse, we're using index middle finger. All right, so thumb side, we count for 15 seconds, multiply by four. All right, you don't have to take it for a full minute. All right, so count by 15 seconds, count for 15 seconds, multiply by four. So if I got 10, bolt, 10, 10 pulses in 15 seconds, then she has a resting heart rate of 40 beats per minute. Um, sometimes this is faint. At rest, you can also use the carotid pulse. All right? It's a stronger pulse, but, but be aware that you make sure you do not put too much pressure because this is a main supply of blood to the head. All right? You put too much pressure, could cause some lightheadedness and dizziness, which is also why it's not recommended that we do this one during exercise. All right? so, Find the uh, middle of the throat, and then just go over in between uh, sternocleidomastoid. Right? So if you can't find that, have them turn one way. There's the muscle that runs behind the ear down to the clavicle. All right? Everybody remember their anatomy? All right? right in between there, and then have them relax. Okay? Now, uh, you can also, you go to the, again, you go to the doctor, and they use the stethoscope. You can also tell you, you can listen and, and count heart rates. All, right. All you need, though, is a stopwatch, stethoscope, or stopwatch in your fingers. All right. Don't use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse in it. All right. So if you're using your thumb to measure their heart rate, then you're going to get interference from your heart rate. Okay. So index, middle finger, use your fingertips, find the pulse. Sometimes if we had, say, uh, in ath athletic training, if you suspect a lower body injury, we'll do pulses down in the feet, behind the ankles, to test circulation of the lower extremities. All right. um, there are one uh, number of times, uh, this is actually one, one time specifically, there was a guy tore his ACL, suspected an ACL tear. He actually had to have emergency surgery because he also uh, tore an artery in the back of his, popliteal artery in the back of his knee. And so he had to go have emergency surgery. Uh, there was no pulse in his foot. All right. So 
those are those are yet yeah, pulses all over typically again radial carotid oscillation or we have heart rate monitors right now during um, resting heart rate when you measure resting heart rate that is always you're always palpating all right um, during cycling tests and running tests and stuff like that we typically have a heart rate monitor on that either connects to a watch or connects to your phone all right you can actually download uh, you can download a heart rate monitor app all right and all you do is you take your finger and you put it over the camera and you hold it still and it measures your heart rate all right so that's an easy one to do as well all right so any any questions with that so we can just do that for the practical screen like the camera. you cannot <laughs> you cannot do that for practical <laughs> The practical when you're measuring resting heart rate is palpation. All right, that's what I require you to do is palpation. Um, if <clears throat> if you um, like during exercise, then we use heart rate monitors. Unless we're doing a step test, step test is also palpation. All right, can you can sit back down. <laughs> when you were doing the